you hear me? Just want to do a check in. Okay. Okay, I guess I'm going to begin. Hi, I'm Betsy Perry, the head of Hello West Hartford. Welcome. To get us started to get today, a few technical details for our Zoom participants. We are muting all audience members. Please use the speaker view to highlight who is speaking. For questions or comments, please use the Q&A located at the bottom of the screen. Click on it and the space for Q&A will appear. Today's program, Welcoming World Voices in West Hartford, is brought to you by Hello West Hartford and several community organizations whose mission is to connect our community through culture and language, to create mutual understanding of our global community, and to cultivate relationships and opportunities as we bring people together. We hope this public dialogue about migration and immigration, stimulated by these experiential films, will give us all an opportunity for connection understanding, and lead to supportive actions. We will put helpful information in the chat box. The link to a feedback form is being posted there now and will be posted there again later. Now I would like to introduce you to a special guest, the West Har Hartford Mayor, Sherry Cantor. Mayor Cantor has served as our mayor since 2016 and deputy mayor since 2011. She values how diversity enriches our community and she is a champion of actions that make positive changes for our community, including supporting Hello West Harford initiatives since its inception in 2010. Welcome, Sherry, Mayor Sherry Cantor. Thank you, Betsy, and thank you for your work to make Hello West Hartford, such a wonderful and vibrant and inclusive event. And we're so thrilled to, uh, to have your leadership and your commitment. Um, Thank you. Hola, is Kai Hawaran. Uh, thank you. Hello. Thank you for being here to, today, tonight, uh, to Hello West Hartford's Welcoming World Voices Film Festival and Discussion. West Hartford recognizes and cares about immigrants, refugees, and those that cross cultural borders and the many contributions they make to our community every day. We understand that these community members have faced and overcome many challenges along the way. We are awed and inspired by their stories, by their courage, and, um, and we really, really are so excited to hear from you. We know that there are many challenges ahead. With over 80 languages spoken by people of West Hartford, we are a multicultural community. Together, we can help break down barriers for families, build businesses, guide, educate students, and help people to create connections that make for inclusive communities. These films and these conversations to follow are yet another way that we can learn from and enrich our community. And through sharing our stories and perspectives, we get to know each other in ways that strengthen West Hartford to take action. In difficult and complicated times, we choose kindness. We offer a warm welcome and ongoing support to these community members transitioning to our community. Thank you for all that you share with us every day. We are so appreciative. We are glad you are here. We welcome West Hartford from wherever, everywhere that you come from. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor Cantor for being here and for your words of wisdom. I would like to introduce Abdi Abdurrahman and Katsiris Rivera Kentz, two of the filmmakers from Community Supported Film, whose work we are going to watch today. Hi guys, hello. Thank you for being here for this screener discussion. Uh, many thanks to Pepsi. Um, Barry from uh, uh, Hello West Harvard for conceiving on this uh, for this event and to her collaborators in this development, Rebecca Satin, Jennifer Evans at West Harvard Community Interactive for partnering up on the production and distribution and to all the other uh, co-hosts and community members who have worked hard over the last couple of months organizing and promoting this event. Again, my name is Abdi. I am originally from Somalia. I am one of the filmmakers whose film you're gonna to watch today. So I'm very excited to be here and looking forward to, you know, 
this discussion. My name is Kat Siris Rivera Kings. I grew up in Puerto Rico and I also made one of the films that you will see today. Um, joining us uh, today for the discussion after the films will be other panelists from Community Supported Film and three panelists who live in or near uh, West Hartford. From Community Supported Film, we are joined by Mani Biswa, who came to the U.S. as a refugee from Bhutan, about whom you will learn more as he's uh, the subject of one of our films. From West Hartford or nearby towns, we are joined by Esam Borai, who grew up in Egypt, Martin Derte, who was born in Belgium and grew up in Europe, and Ernest Ernestine Nobel, who grew up in, I in the Ivory Coast. All will be fully introduced after the films by our special discussion moderator, Dr. Christiana Best. Great. All right, uh, so now the introductions are done. We're going to take 35 minutes to watch the films. Uh, we'll get things started with a short video introducing the project. During this intro video, you will hear three questions that we would like you to consider while watching the film. Uh, and please uh, add your comments and questions in the Q&A. Thank you again for being here and looking forward to the discussion afterwards. The films you are about to watch were made by and about new immigrants and refugees in the United States. We made these films because we believe in the power of documentary storytelling to affect public opinion and policy. We want the national debate about immigrants and immigration to be informed by the experiences and voices of new immigrants and refugees. We have to find the story. What is it? That's your research. Most of us came to this project with experience in some form of storytelling, but few of us have done any filmmaking. Community supported film provided training and mentored us through the process of finding a story and filming it. Experienced editors worked with us on the post-production. Community supported film's mission is to amplify local voices in under or misrepresented communities so that they can effectively communicate their lived reality through documentary filmmaking. Our projects focus on people, places, and situations, be they in Afghanistan, Haiti, or the United States, that we hear a lot about in the news, but seldom understand from the local perspective. Our films are designed to be the starting point for discussion. I'm curious why the filmmakers think that immigration becomes such a contentious point in society and why we default to hate or division. I think the biggest thing that would be helpful in turning a page in how much hate is being spread around this world is really just talking. We immigrants, we came to contribute to this country. Please take advantage of the discussion guides and questions that you have been provided with, or which you can access from Community Supported Films website. While there, please donate. This work depends on your support. While watching our films, please keep in mind questions like, what in our films reminds you of things or experiences in your own life? Or conversely, what feels unfamiliar, new, or surprising? I don't remember these kids. Such a Those are your cousins from your father's side. Really? Mm -hmm. Some describe the United States as a melting pot, where all the ingredients become one, and others as a salad bowl, which all ingredients remain distinct. Do you want our subjects to melt or remain distinct? One, two, three, push with your legs up. Can you imagine our subjects being misunderstood, stereotyped, or attacked for what they look like or where they come from? What actions should we take to address these misunderstandings or confrontations? Thanks for watching. We hope that our subject stories create a strong and lasting impression. <laughs> Hi, my name is Abdurrahman Abdi. I immigrated as a young boy and a refugee from Somalia in 2007. I graduated in 2018 from UMass Boston with a degree in media communication and sociology. 
I use my multimedia production skills to address the economic and social issues facing my neighborhood in Boston and its Somali community. Here's my film. Thank you for watching. America in 1993 because of civil war. No I say, oh, I'm 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 i Yes, <laughs> Surprise, you know, the sisters kiss a higher. Trying to get better every single day. of Samara Kumahan, and I'm a task with me, you want to come from my always a how you plan to choose for social fairness. Who will Ama ay gibaan kumu kala shaqayna ya ama ani gibaa badalan ba marka language ke gi mesha ayu ka qabaha iyal ke wa ka xuma ina baray ha Okay, Islam, 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 
kamu 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 Malmahan so sada miris kan so sada umum malay na so malay yang lu untuk kena ya dahan. Mereka is much better dengan kau kau yang nampak. Lima muka berhalai. Muka berhalai orang kan. Sedang umam perisoh. Ya kek ini juga malu gih, tapi macam kalau ini tengah melah en, diwah. Ah soal tanya muka sebut ini nanti sama program kan. Jemaat kepada itu saya tuan cerita cerita sangat kawas sangat kubur hari jam ada itu. Wajar tak nak bertanya doktor. Dari sana ke ucapan tadi itu jam ada itu jam ada wajar saya nak game kerja saya basketball. Ini yang di bawah wajah lagi ni basketball ke ayar tu. Mereka ni umur ogahan basketball ke ayar tu. Lagi mereka akhir ini kebab di rafton basketball basketball absen sekolah. Wow sih macam ni. Allah ikut dengan aneka mamu yang bagus. We were hiring the Madeira because Kamar the Gallery was here. And of course, of course, basketball, I are right. Why not? Why are the Madeira? I mean, I saw it again. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go to basketball. I are going to go to virtual. I are so what do I have to say? Like in basketball, I are so. Levan is very lucky. Each one has a picture. We have a picture of a lot of Somalian youth. Frankie says it's global to him. It will have a person being in him. It focuses on a young person. Of can and get a name in Mark. I don't know how I can of Mark. They in the money who you the end in our movie. Hard cover with your eye and culture. He said language. He said didn't he so bad. سمع الله لمن حمده
Hi, my name is Said Hashimi. I immigrated with my wife and three young children from Afghanistan in 2016. I grew up in Afghanistan and as a refugee in Pakistan. I worked in Afghanistan from 2005 to 2016 as a journalist and translator with the BBC and NATO. In the US, I worked at the New American Center in Lynn, Massachusetts, assisting other new immigrants and refugees. I'm now a communication officer at the Afghan Embassy in Washington, DC. This is my first work on documentary film. Here is my film. Thanks for watching. Were your parents married before your 18th birthday? I never thought that I will be in this country. I never heard about America when I was a little kid. And now I am here in a big country. So I'm one of the case managers for the refugees here in the New American Center. Did you lay in your shag on Nosta? Yes, Okay. How many more dumplings you are making? I was born in Bhutan. My whole family came to refugee camp in 1991, and I stayed there in refugee camp for more than 17 years. Look at that, Jack. So yummy, right? Yeah. I have uh, three boys with my wife. They are now more used to with the American food, not our cultural food. I do prepare American food, like sometimes my wife's. She definitely do most of our traditional food. I choose the easy way, steaks and burgers and hot dogs. <laughs> What's this? It's done? No. Not yet? A little bit of time? Okay. What's this? I don't think about corporal punishment on the Sanera, Jun Bandan Unsas, the Anir Saint, Usli, Enna, Usko Sarico, Sabe, Unga, Rune, Tio Tingur, Hoke, Pasiki on the Star, Top Put on a subway. Back in our country, it was very hard to practice our own religion. There was some of the religious persecution. Bhutan government brought a policy called Diglam Namja, which means one nation, one people, one religion. And Bhutan is the Buddhist country. People can go to the church. There was no church. People can read Bibles. We don't have that fear here, and that makes us feel very happy. Good morning, this is Mani from Lynn Community Health Center. I am calling to schedule an appointment for you. In Lynn Community Health Center, I used to be an interpreter but now my role is a community health worker. Father, mother, yeah. they all live there? Yeah, all in oh. Cambodia. Yeah, Cambodia, me. I live in all in one. Are you working in? Uh... I work a no, Uber driver. Oh, you do Uber driver? Yeah. Wow, good. We had a lot of stories, patients sharing us that they have a lot of anxiety and they have a lot of difficulties going on. They even don't feel comfortable to walk into the health center. They feel like they might be arrested, they might be deported. This is really sad for me. Very good, let me go get you next. People came here basically for hope. They are seeking help from us. Good to see you. Yeah. 
ठीक है सर तो क्या करूँ बने नहीं आ तो मैं को पढ़ी लाखो आ पनी जो चीजें रुपए रखे रहा अन्य जो पनी रखे रहा एक जो ठीक आ तो घर उन्हें अरसा को बॉस रहे जो फोन करे रहा when I came uh, in the U.S. Uh, as a refugee, it was a little bit challenges for myself in terms of language. We know a little bit of English, but it is very hard for um, people to understand what we are trying to say. As soon as I get here, I started going to the ESL class. My teachers, they guide me how to navigate things here. So I started helping our own community. if we can sit down with one refugees and immigrants, we will be amazed by listening their stories and their experiences in their life. A refugee is that person who has lost everything in his life, but he haven't given up his hope. He still has hope, he still has energy, he still has power. We just uh, need a little bit of help and support. Once in a week, we all come together, share our prayers, our struggles. It was very hard for people who are 50 and older. They feel very lonely. They are isolated at their home. So when we have that kind of gathering and they feel so happy and um, they are always welcome. I don't know why uh, American people who, who are here, why they uh, don't want immigrants or refugees here. I don't understand because when I look back to the history of America, there are so many people who are immigrant, even the white peoples migrated from different countries. They work hard, they got a uh, hope, they got help. We should uh, continue, no matter who, whether we are white, green, black, brown, all are human and we have the same red blood. Hi, my name is Katsiris Rivera Kings. I moved from Puerto Rico to Boston in 2016. I'm a scholar activist who works closely with the Puerto Rican diaspora in the US on issues of cultural identity and the political relationship with the United States. Although Puerto Ricans are American citizens, they cross the same cultural borders as immigrants in the US. This is my first work with video storytelling. Here's my film, thanks for watching.
And now the Brighton High School dancers dancing bomba. Yo la quiero, yo la quiero. The audience is going to be singing. Yo la quiero, y no lo niego. Pa. The first presentation I did in a school in 1987, Puerto Rican student came to me and said, I was ashamed to get into the theater because I thought they were going to be laughing that the things are mine. But when I saw them enjoying, having fun, and accepting understanding, I felt so proud about me. And I never thought I was so important. Yo la quiero, everybody. I was like, oh, wow. And his friends Kenya, non Puerto Rican white people. There was a lot of changes in type of behaviors. Camina mi bomba. Bomba. That's when I said, I cannot stop this work. We might be different in many aspects, but we need to start understanding and respect diversity. From the diversity, we find the commonalities. Todo el mundo estamos interesados en 100% estar ahí. No podemos quedar, no, nosotros nos vamos a quedar. Exacto. My work is about community. That's where I am, a cultural activist. I have to engage with community. The fact that now as Puerto Ricans, we feel like a fearful. Sometimes we feel as immigrants, we think that we can be taken out of this country. It doesn't make sense. They need support. They call me to be an advocate, to look for the leaders, and I have to do that. That's a part of the cultural activism. Hola, oh, Jaime. Mira, este, esto es sobre la reunión esta que tenemos mañana. Y ahí ya básicamente convocé a todo el mundo. Hablé con José Mazón para comenzar y comenzar con un plan de trabajo. Y tú eres ahí, muchachos, punto de lanza, bien, bien importante que estés ahí. Bueno, pues cuídate mucho. Nos vemos mañana. Gracias. Un abrazo, Fernando. Ok, bye -bye.
izquierdo, un panel está inspirando. That's more than one shade. When you see them dancing and they don't want to stop, there's change of behavior there. Okay, there's changes of attitudes. There is acceptance also. There is recognition and there is respect. <laughs> Better, 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 better. Remember, I said one thing to you guys. It feels, you know, it's a little different playing when you're so spread out from people. So you really got to extra focus on locking in. Since we don't have the bass, we yeah. need to keep it tight. Okay, let's do one more time the dance of the dances and resolve the end. Let's take it from there. Okay. Boom, bye, play, na play. We need to move the young generation, whatever you choose to do, or be the best. And make sure that when you die, you at least something for the older generation to come. Thank you for all, all, thank you all for such a wonderful collection of stories. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christiana Best, who, who will be moderating our discussion today. Dr. Best is originally from Granada. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Social Work and Equitable Community Practice at the University of St. Joseph. She co-chairs the New York City chapter of the National Association of Social Works Immigration and Global, and Global Social Work Committee. Currently, she's engaged in a nationwide research project, project. It examines how racial, ethnic, it examines how racial and ethnic identification by Caribbean and Central American immigrants relate to experiences of daily racial microaggressions in the workplace. Since she also hosts the podcast Inside Out, Outside In, which engages in conversation between academia and its communities and is framed by the themes of diversity, inclusion, and equity. Welcome, Dr. Best. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am really happy to be here and to be part of Welcoming World Voices in West Hartford. Thank you, hello, West Hartford, for inviting me. As an immigrant, I'm always interested in forums that uplift immigrants and refugees. 
After looking at the film, there I thought all three were amazing in every way. All three managed to communicate the significance of cultural identity and pride, specifically as it relates to language, religion, values, culture, race, and the occupation of space. While at the same time, each film illuminates the impact of political, social, environmental, and economic issues that refugees and immigrants face as individuals, families, and communities. To some extent, all of these films touched on issues of inclusion and exclusion. They examine who belongs and who doesn't, as well as who is accepted and valued, and those that are seen as strangers or visitors. The themes and messages of the film also speak to resilience of individuals, families, and communities. They emphasize the need to hold on to some of the values and traditions of the past from the old world while adapting to new environment in order to move forward, thrive, and survive. So I am extraordinarily happy to start the questioning. And Betsy, I'm going to ask you to keep me on target as it relates to time. Um, I will start by asking the filmmakers and uh, Manny some questions, and then we're going to stop and see if there are any questions in the Q&A, and we're going to get those out. Then we'll move to the local panelist. So my first question is for Abdi. Abdi, as a Somali, uh, Somali American, your position as an insider provided us with a revealing view of the Somali, Somalian immigrant community in Massachusetts. World Apart at Home portrays an intergenerational cultural clash between parents who were first generation immigrants and their children who were born in the United States. My first question to you is, the Somali community shares some attributes to African-American community as it relates to race and socioeconomic status in Roxbury, Massachusetts. What is the relationship between the Somali community and the African-American community in Roxbury, Massachusetts, taking into consideration issues of racial injustice and Black Lives Matter? Are there worlds apart at home? Yeah, th thank you, Dr. Best. Uh, yes, my film, you know, examines, the, uh, betrays the cultural clash between immigrant parents and their American children. And a lot of that comes from parents wanting their children to be more like them, to have and share the same culture, same language, same religion. And, you know, when that doesn't happen a lot of times, that leads to some, uh, you know, in-home problems. Luckily, my uh, subject's family is still a young family, so, the subject of my family, Samira, she's still hopeful that she can have more things to share with her, uh, more things to teach or to share with her, her young people, young, young children. As far as, you know, the clash between the black immigrant community and the um, African-Americans, at least in Roxbury, uh, weirdly enough, there is some racial or colorism uh, tensions of um, better than you type of attitude. That comes from usually from the immigrants towards the African-Americans because of how cultural, how media usually betrays them. And I don't know, I mean, honestly, as much as I really would like to talk about that, it's really nothing compares to what's going on in, you know, uh, in black and white America. You know, when it comes to immigrants, black immigrants, you know, it's, we all face the same discrimination. Uh, we all face the same you know, police brutality, we all get killed in ways. So it's it's really a problem, but, you know, it's nothing compared to what's going on currently in this country. Okay. Thank you. I am going to move to Manny and then Katsi and then come back to you with a second question. Sure. Okay, so take a moment. Manny, my next question is for you. Um, Manny, we learned that your family escaped to a refugee camp from Buddhist Bhutan, where you were being where you were being persecuted as Christians. In the film, you stated that a refugee is that person who has lost everything in his life but hasn't given up hope. A very profound statement. 
Can you share some of the losses some of the members of the Bhutanese community have experienced and some of the gains that they have made in, in America? Thank you, uh, Dr. Best, uh, for the uh, question. Uh, yes, of course. Um, Bhutan is a, a very small country, uh, but uh, economically, uh, it is a rich country. A lot of people, uh, they used to have a huge farm and um, they grow their crops, vegetables, fruit, whatever they need in their own farm. They raise their animals in their own farm. Uh, but uh, when the persecution started, people didn't have time to sell those things. People didn't have time to take care of those things. I still remember the night that uh, we flew from Bhutan. I was a very young kid. Um, we flew in the middle of the night and I was just thinking, you know, uh, maybe something going on. We might be uh, going somewhere else. But uh, we reached in a certain place uh, where there was a top of the hill. My mom, uh, she looked down to her house, to her uh, field, and she said, uh, we never uh, going to come back here again. Um, so um, that was a very heartbreaking moment. Uh, and um, uh, we lost everything. Uh, and we spent um, more than 17 years, some people even 20, 25 years in refugee camp. And um, uh, now you will find the largest community, Bhutanese community in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and some other places. So the first generation people who migrated to uh, US they, you know, they haven't forgot anything. Now, if you go to their places, you know, people, even who are living in a small apartment, they started having a small garden in front of them. They are growing some uh, flowers. They are uh, growing some vegetables, you know. They want to uh, bring back their uh, memories, life. They want to, you know, uh, bring everything uh, live. Uh, so that is uh, um, what going on in our community. And, you know, um, some of people even started, you know, instead of uh, doing some business or instead of uh, going to work in a, a warehouse, um, they collected a small amount of money and they are buying the land and they are growing crops here also. So uh, this uh, tells us that, you know, our people, they haven't forgotten anything and they, are, they still have hope and they are bringing their hope alive now. Wow, thank you for that. I was told also that you were a principal in a school prior to coming. Can you sh share a little bit about that? That must have been a loss as well. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, in uh, refugee camp, uh, our early school was uh, open ground. Uh, there was no classroom settings. Uh, there was nothing just uh, under the shade of the tree, you know, teachers just having a white blackboard, um, writing something there and giving a lecture. Uh, we struggled so hard and um, we never uh, give up to go to school. And I am very fortunate uh, to get those educational opportunities. Um, and I was a school principal um, back uh, in my country. Um, I had the chance to get a higher education and I was a school principal um, because I thought that this is a good time for me to give back to the community. Um, so that is why I became a school principal over there. And coming back to U.S. also, uh, whatever I have learned in my life, I am using those skills and techniques to uh, support our community. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Katsi, um, your film tells the story of Ho He, a Puerto Rican dancer, musician, educator, and political activist. 
uh, who engages people of all ages through dance and music. With a master's of education degree from Harvard University, Hohe identifies as a cultural activist, which includes advocating on behalf of the Puerto Rican community with systems and institutions, particularly the educational system. Given they are citizens of the US, how important is the Puerto Rican community to still have a cultural activist? And why is that? Thank you, Dr. Bass, and thank you. Um, hello, what's the part for everyone that's watching? Um, yeah, so that, thank you for that question. Um, what he approaches cultural activism through the arts um, and education. So while doing so, he wants to, what I learned as I was filming him, um, he, he wanted to strengthen the self-esteem, leadership, and cultural values of his students and the community. So as we saw in the film, he's always connecting the arts to education, and that, that's basically what makes him a, a cultural activist. So he never misses a chance to make that connection that is ultimately affecting the sense of belonging and self-esteem of the community. Um, as we saw with the student that didn't seem confident enough to perform, uh, perform in his um, Puerto Rican mess in the theater um, in front of a big audience. So there are other, I'm thinking about other instances where cultural activists work with uh, hand in hand with, can, can you hear me? Yeah, and we're having some difficulty with the sound, Katsy. So, um, I'm going to move on and then let's see if we could work on your sound and we'll come back to you. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so Abdi, I'm going to come back to you with my second question. Um, one of the many things I found noteworthy in your film was how the mother Samar was able to negotiate the tensions between the two cultures when it came to her daughter's unconventional desire to play basketball in college, even though it meant going against tradition, wearing shorts and playing with boys. Your vision and decision to highlight this specific issue in the Somali community leads me to think you're an activist. Can you tell me why it was important for you to amplify that issue? I don't know if I'm an activist, hopefully in a couple of years, but I think Samira is a unique person who is challenging or maybe modifying the old way of things, especially the double standards when it comes to, you know, which child participates in playing sports. And a lot of that comes from because she has this unique relationship with her daughter where she, you know, wants to understand what her children wants, what their goals are, or how can she sort of help them in a way. Uh, but if I may sort of break away from the question and sort of give you a little update about the daughter, the basketball player, Jamat, uh, she recently graduated from college with a biology degree, and she has over 450,000 followers on Instagram because of her basketball skills. She is followed by the likes of artists like Drake, um, a lot of NBA players, and, you know, currently she's getting a lot of offers to work for Nike or Adidas, a lot of different universities to work on their camp. But she's sort of also doing her own thing where she has Jamad uh, basketball camp where she's training and, you know, teaching other young Muslim girls how to present, her, present themselves on a basketball court as well as off the basketball court. So, but if you get a chance, if you really want to keep up with Jamad, she sort of, after we uh, stopped filming, she went viral for a couple of videos she made and She'd been all over the news. So if you can Google her, Google Jamad or follow her on Instagram, underscore J-A-M-A-A-D. I think I'll, I'll, I'll just put it on the chat and if you wanted to look it up. So, you know, I, I think that's where really is coming from. The idea that you allow your children to be themselves and, you know, they go out there and really try to influence the whole world. That's what Jamad is up to now. So. Wow, that's very consistent to many immigrants and refugees, right? Being an entrepreneurs and moving in that direction, right? That that's something they have done really well in terms of making contributions to this country. I agree with you. I think, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're all immigrants, so we have to start somewhere. 
Great. Um, I do have one more question before I leave. Um, okay, so it appears in the film that children in the Somali community attended special schools um, mm -hmm. that strengthened their cultural identity, language, religion. Um, how prevalent is that today? And my question for you is if you have when you have your own children or if you decide to have children, would you send them to these specialized schools? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very important to teach your young people, you know, your ways of life as well as, you know, give them any chance that they can be a better person. And I think, yeah, you're right. There are a lot of Saturday schools, Islamic schools that a lot of the kids go to, like the ones that you saw in the video. And, you know, to give an example, in this country, I think there's Catholic schools and there's Hebrew classes, I mean, Hebrew schools that go on all year. So it's not just, you know, Somalis, it's not just Muslims. I think just everyone is doing it. And I think, mm -hmm. yeah. So personally, would I send my kids? Of course, yeah. I really want to give my kids any chance they can to become a better people, better people that help their neighbors and, you know, people who have a good relationship with their neighbors, I guess. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Um, how is the audio with, with Katsi? Uh, if if you can wait just a few minutes to come back to Katsi, please. Absolutely, absolutely. So Manny, I'm coming back to you. Um, in your intro, uh, let's see, Manny. Um, okay. One of the messages we heard, Manny, in the film was that often members of the Bhutanese community are afraid to seek help because they're afraid they will be deported. What do you think fuels these messages and contributes to the thinking? And what can be done to counter that message, particularly on a local level? Um, yes, uh, thank you so much for the question. <clears throat> Yes, uh, the fear is started, uh, you know, um, when this uh, new administration started, there are a lot of uh, cuts in the funding for uh, resettlement agencies. You know, um, I uh, also work here in a um, community-based organization, uh, which is um, ORR funded. But because of the cuts on the funds, uh, um, we are not able to do a lot of works in the community level. Like, for example, we do case management, we do ESL classes, health education, orientation, job search, job orientation, after school program. But because of the cuts in funding, uh, we are not able to uh, do a lot of things. And, you know, the community members are coming and asking questions to us. Hey, what is going on? Uh, why uh, uh, you are not providing some of the programs in this center now? And we have, we just have to say we lost funding and we are not able to do those things. And people are also uh, hearing a lot of news, you know, uh, a lot of people have been caught by the eyes and, you know, a lot of people who didn't have their documentation or for whatever reason, people are deported. And so with that news, there is a lot of trauma and fear going on in the people's uh, mind. You know, when we flew, uh, our forefathers, you know, uh, they migrated from Nepal to Bhutan. They settled down there. And, you know, finally, because of the prosecution, they have to become a refugee in Nepal again, you know. And now we are, even though we are resettled in U.S. and people have those things in their mind, who knows, maybe we will again be deported or maybe mm. we have to flee this country. Mm -hmm. Those sort of uh, questions going on in people's mind. So those are intergenerational trauma that continues even today. Um, that's interesting. Um, yes. So I have one more question for you, if you don't mind. I, I noticed in the film that you invite the community into your home. And I was thinking, um, 
first of all, it's very selfless, but um, how, and it seems like it's a way of keeping the community together, um, but with COVID-19, how are you um, d dealing with that? How is the community handling that? The ability to get together, I imagine, is impacted, right? Yes, it is very, very hard um, because uh, when we are in refugee camp, you know, uh, the smallest, I was from the smallest camp and we have uh, more than 17,000 people living <laughs> in that smallest camp. Mm. So we all are like a family, no matter who is, you know, we, we spend together for so long and everyone became um, like a family, you know. Uh, I still remember, you know, I just grab, if there is nothing at home, I just grab a plate and go to different door, you know. My plate will be full and I don't have to worry. <laughs> we came from such a, uh, you know, tradition. We came from such a huge culture. And when we uh, came to US and we are trying to, you know, uh, still make a connection the gathering in my family was, you know, to comfort each other, you know, uh, to appreciate each other, to share their feelings, you know, to uh, answer their questions if they have, you know, to help each other if they need any sort of help, you know, or uh, figure it out what they are lacking and to find out resources if they need anything. But with the pandemic, you know, uh, it was very hard and a lot of people are going through so many challenges, you, especially people who have uh, mental health issues, you know, they are going through a lot. And uh, we uh, try to uh, do some certain things through Zoom, but it always doesn't work, you know, <laughs> or people, uh, they are not familiar with the technology, they are not right. familiar with how to use internet and stuff like that. It is a huge challenge and it is, people are going through a lot. Oh, wow. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. We wish you all the best. Thank you. All right. So at this point, I'm going to check in again to see how Katsi's uh, audio is doing. I'm back. I think. Oh, good. <laughs> all right. Thank you. I'm really happy that it's working. Um, so was there anything else? Should we start from the beginning? Because I think it was hard for the audience to hear you. Um, do, do you recall the question? Do you want me to repeat it? You can repeat just like the last the, part. Of yeah, the, the last part. <laughs> right. Given that uh, Puerto Ricans are citizens of the United States, how important is it for the Puerto Rican community to still have a cultural activist? And why is that? So, as we saw in the film with Jorge, um, he is always connecting the arts um, to education, and basically that's what makes him a cultural activist. Um, while doing so, he he seeks to um, strengthen strengthen uh, self esteem, leadership, and cultural values of the students and the community. Um, so he rarely miss, misses a uh, chance to make that, that connection that is ultimately um, affecting the sense of belonging and self-esteem um, of the community. Um, one example is the, the time that the student was not comfortable enough or confident enough to actually perform in a, in a theater about her, his, his or her uh, Puerto Ricanness um, in front of a big audience. So when I think of a cultural activist, I also think um, of them as uh, working hand in hand with political activists. Um, one example is um, right after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, um, people, people started organizing and artists such as Jorge, Rosy Amador, that we saw in the, in the film as well, collaborated in fundraising and other aid efforts for Puerto Rico. Um, all this to say that people like Jorge and or cultural activists are always building bridges and expanding the voices of the Caribbean and Puerto Rican peoples, and that's um, that's I think that's a very important uh, 
duty in community building. Um, so it, either if it's, um, it doesn't matter if it's uh, Puerto Rican uh, cultural activists, but all cultural activists from all cultures um, that do this kind of work um, are very valuable for building bridges and connecting. Right. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and this is sort of a connection to the first question. In your introduction, you mentioned that while Puerto Ricans are citizens, they cross cultural borders like immigrants. How significant is the cultural and political divide between the US and Puerto Rico? And to what extent do you think your film, Rhythm of Respect, bridges the cultural and political divide? Yes. Yeah, so Puerto Ricans who come to the U.S., including myself, um, are very likely to encounter a gap um, between how we used to live, act, um, and relate with others in Puerto Rico. Very small things, um, which can go from small things to big, big things. Um, and they clash on how we are expected, quote, quote unquote, to do so here in the U.S. So there's a, a, a gap where we, we, we need to navigate um, and uh, see a way to fit in in the most adequate way. Um, so in that case, there's no citizenship that can just make us escape that reality on um, that gap. Um, so I'm not saying that Puerto Ricans have uh, the most difficult transition when migrating to the U.S., but that there is a new social um, landscape that they uh, need to navigate upon their arrival. Um, so I, I would add something there very important about the Puerto Rican migrants, and it's that it's not a homogeneous, count of, a homogeneous group. Like not all Puerto Rican migrants came to the U.S. at the same time. There are um, historic um, migrations that, that have happened during the history. Um, some Puerto Ricans came um, to uh, um, during the mid 40s and 60s. Um, there are Puerto Ricans that have been born and raised here and they don't speak Spanish and that's no problem. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have people that migrated um, after during the 2006 recession, economic recession, after Hurricane Maria, after the, the earthquakes, and all the and people that have migrated between all those events um so we all have different experiences but there's also uh, there's always a social um uh a social gap there when when they migrate um yeah so i just connecting with the, the actual question was uh, the film i i wanted it to bridge the cultural and political divide um, showing and further educating uh, United Stations um, about the importance of valuing and understanding Afro-Caribbean, Puerto Rican, every uh, culture that conforms the United States. Great, thank you. Um, I do have one last question for you before we move to the Q&A, but I wanna check in with Pepsi to see how we're doing with time. I, can... I think, uh, sorry, um, we are at 410. So okay. I think we should go to a audience question. Okay, thank you. Thank okay, you. we have um, quite a few great ones. Um, one particularly um, for Abdi. Um, Abdi, there are a lot of there's a lot for your generation to deal with as young immigrants and with what's going on in the country um, with Black Lives Matter and COVID. How do you talk about discrimination or challenges with your family, friends, and religious cultural communities? Do you feel there are open forums to be able to talk? Thank you, Eleanor yep. Hong. Uh, th thank you for the question. Uh, I think uh, recently more than ever, uh, we have been, uh, you know, at least with my family or the young people that I work with in my community, we have been more likely sort of a protesting and experiencing, you know, racial discrimination at hand or sort of seeing it on TV. So really 
uh, as far as me having a discussion with my brothers or younger boys or girls who are in my community, it has always been sort of a do not resist, always just be, uh, you know, always be on the safeguard, just be, you know, uh, don't do anything that will get you killed. So it just, it's, it's tough to say to a young person, but it's really that's, that was sort of our, our conversation. Okay, uh, I have one more. Um, this is for, um, I believe, Mani. But any of you can answer. Over time, has a sense of has a sense of comfort living in the United States increased, or does it get harder based on the ages of children or the p political cli climate? Maybe Mani. Um. I think uh, uh, yes. Um, sometimes um, it is become um, harder because you know our parents, the first generation parents, um, who came, uh, who have a very little knowledge about the U.S. culture, they are facing a lot of challenges because the kids um, uh, they grew here and they go to the school system here and they add up very quickly. But our parents, um, they are the ones who are facing challenges. And it is harder for them. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I think we should move along to um, our local uh, West Hartford uh, guests and participants. And um, please continue the questions. They're fantastic. Yes, thank you. So we have three panelists. Um, local panelist. The first one is Isam Bare, who lives in West Hartford and grew up in Egypt, where he began his work as a political and human rights activist. He played a key role in the Egyptian revolution of 2011 and had to leave Egypt after being sentenced to two years in prison for his political activism. In 2013, he moved to Washington, D.C., where he worked for the U.S. Institute for Peace Currently, Isam works for Lawyers Without Borders and served on many nonprofit boards. Recently, as in three weeks, he became a U.S. citizen. Congratulations, Isam. <laughs> I'm going to just introduce all three and then we'll start the questions. Martine Duarte was born in Belgium and, became, and came to the U.S. about 20 years ago. She's a refugee program manager for the Connecticut Institute for, Im for Refugees and Immigrants, which includes overseeing refugee programs as well as providing case management. She currently lives in Bridgeport and moved there two years ago from Miami, where she also resettled refugees. Welcome, Martine. And the last one is Ernestine Nobu. Ernestine is a resident of West Hartford and grew up in the Ivory Coast, a French speaking West African country. She migrated to the United States in 2000 and became a US citizen in 2005. Before coming to the US, Ernestine worked at the United Nations and the European Union offices. She worked in the West Hartford public schools and recently completed her master's degree in social work. Ernestine volunteers as a family specialist with the Migration Refugee Immigration Services at Catholic Charities. Welcome, Ernestine. Okay, um, so I am going to um, start my questions by, uh, which is directed to both Martine and Ernestine. Um, this is question, my question is, Please share with us the type of work you do, the significance of your work with immigrants, and the benefits and challenges of working with immigrants today during the pandemic. Who would like to begin? I'll go. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so I work as family specialist for the refugee and immigrant population at Catholic Charities. And so in my position, I help refugees and immigrants in many ways daily. I uh, provide them, I help them with housing and along with housing, you know, like, you know, furniture, uh, household items in general. <coughs> I help them also with, I refer them for job, for employment services. 
I uh, help them uh, enroll their children in school. I also help them get medical and clinic, you know, um, <coughs> assistance, state benefits, and uh, legal resources for social security, working permits, applying for green cards and citizenship. Uh, I sometimes provide interpretation because some of our population are French speaking. And when I cannot help directly, I uh, seek help with interpretation for the refugees. Um, the struggle, the struggle all along, but during the COVID particularly, the struggle has been primarily monetary. So they usually work manual jobs. So most of them were home, lost their job or could not go to work. Um, the other struggle that they face was also the student population. So our student population uh, struggle with uh, internet service. They have like no poor internet service or no internet, no internet service at all in the homes. So following doing the virtual school was very challenging, was very struggling, very struggle with that. The little one was even, it was even worse because parents have either little or no uh, knowledge of computer skills. So it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> The refugees, especially, they, they're very, all of them were very stressed and overwhelmed. And for the refugee population, it was like a re-trauma because these are people that come from a trauma, you know, war strike country. And so they're traumatized. They flee you know, from oppression and, 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 and war and come here and then they're facing this uh, pandemic and have no idea what tomorrow will be. So they're very overwhelmed, they're stressed, and it's like a real trauma for them. Um, the bigger difficulty that I personally um, experienced during the pandemic is that I lost two of my, my clients. It was very difficult because they had no family here. So <laughs> I made a lot of calls, you know, trying to reach the families back home, uh, contact the hospital back and forth, called employers, called landlords, called uh, our funeral homes to make funeral arrangements. And also finally tried to find money. So I reached out to the community, to the local uh, immigrant and refugee communities to fund, to raise funds in order to, you know, do uh, the funeral service or, you know, funeral arrangement for these clients. So it was very difficult for me. I was a little bit, you know, personally overburdened. Mm -hmm. And um, now the benefits of working with this population, I would say it's very interesting. You have great reward. You have great experience being exposed to the culture, the new values, new way of seeing things. So it's very, for me, it was very rewarding because you learn a lot from them. Uh, the other benefit that I see working with the population is that um, you are, it's very, you are like the go-to person. You have a shoulder that they lean on. You have a person that they talk to. And so you feel that you're making a difference. Somebody relies on you for help. And for me, it's very fulfilling. Mm. Wow. Thank you so very much for that. You are doing some really tough work. Thank you. Um, so Martine. Hi. Yes. So well, uh, Ernestine said it all in a way, um, because we share our work. Um, we do serve a little bit of different population. Uh, we both serve a lot of, um, you know, Congolese who have been resettled, whether it is in Rwanda or in Kenya uh, or Mozambique. But then we also receive uh, Syrians. We also receive a lot of Eritreans, um, Afghanistans. So we, you know, it's... Um, as she said, it's it's difficult for a lot of people, especially right now. Uh, I'm going to go also in the COVID mode just because Ernestine mentioned it and because it has definitely affected a lot of the refugees and the immigrants that are coming, not only for refugees. I think even people who are working, employees, Americans, everybody has been affected in one way or another by COVID. For refugees, though, and immigrants that we are serving, um, you know, I I work in Bridgeport, um, 
and uh, for the Connecticut Institute for Refugee and Immigrants. And what we have noticed mostly is a domestic violence increase during this COVID. As people are not able to go to work, are they stuck, stuck in the house or for those who are losing their employment, um, you know, it brings new challenges. They do not know how to cope. They don't even know where to go because you are expected to quarantine. You are expected to self-care at home. Um, a lot of the clinics or the medical community centers are not really seeing people either. Um, and so it's really difficult to call for help when there is really nobody. Everything, all the services are being provided through video calls or through phones. Uh, and so, you know, domestic violence is really high. Mental health is also extremely high. Um, it is how to deal. So as Ernestine said, a lot of refugees and immigrants feel that they are being re-traumatized. Um, and we are there, we are the person, we are those that they rest their shoulders on. They expect us to have the answers. They expect us to know what to do, even during this COVID time. And yet, you know, it is really hard for us to explain that we are going through this ourselves for the very first time, and we are trying to navigate the system. Mm -hmm ourselves we're doing the very best that we can we also know that there are a lot of limits that are placed on us and on them uh, and i think communication sometimes is a little bit stringent just because they're so used to being able to come to us and we will fix everything and right now it is being challenged uh, but still it is the best job in the world there is no other <laughs> job like helping refugees there's nothing like it. Uh, you know, you, you, you work all day long to make someone's life better. That's, that's all it is. That's the bottom line. You come home and you're happy. You've tried just a little bit to make somebody's life a little bit easier. Uh, you know, often like we've asked refugees, what is it? What's the one thing that you really need? They just want to smile. They want to know that they're welcome in the community. They want to know that people are going to accept them around. So you don't have to speak the same language. You don't have to transcend the same culture, but smile. That's, that's all it takes, really. Just a little smile. And, and you will see their smile and their smile is worth a million dollars because it's just the brightest of all. Uh, I, I, you know, I also want to say because, you know, I am in Connecticut, absolutely love Connecticut. Connecticut is so welcoming to refugees, to all immigrants. You can see everybody walking in the streets. You can hear all of the different languages and it is perfectly acceptable here. There is no judgment for it. And I think that that also makes the perfect nest for refugees and immigrants to come here. So and I think I will leave it at that so that everybody else can speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is very helpful. Um, I will move on to um, Isam. Isam, I have a question for you. And then after that question, Betsy, I'm going to check in with you to see if there are any questions related to this issue from the Q&A. Um, so Isam, on March 12, 2019, Representatives Lucille Rabalad and Nadia Velasquez and Yvette Clark introduced the American Dream and Promise Act of 2019, HR 6. The bill combines longstanding effort to provide a roadmap to US citizenship for undocumented youth and people who are eligible to be DACA recipients and temporary protective services. What steps do you feel can be taken on a local level to move Congress to pass this bill? Thank you so much for having me and, and thank you for great movies and films we watched today, really moving and brought a lot of uh, memories and tears and emotions. Um, to answer your question, so you, as, as a local community, we have two things we can do, a long-term and, and a short-term, an immediate action and a long-term action. And the, the immediate action, it's, it's we have a privilege here, uh, which is voting, a uh, privilege that's not um, it's, it doesn't exist for so many people, and I was one of them who fought so hard for the right to vote and, and having free elections um, back in, in my home country. 
So voting, it's a really, it's, it's a strong privilege that we all have and we should actually act on it and share our opinions about issues we care about immig immigration and immigrant included in, in that. Um, I know from my experience, sometimes writing to an elected officials or making phone calls for them is not the most effective way, but actually sharing public opinion and having a conversation on those issues on social media and other platforms that will be more connected to our social network actually more powerful than writing a, a, a petition to a, to a, a politician to do something. So the, the immediate action is to vote and make your voice heard by sharing on your platforms and, and social media and, so, and, and your real actual uh, social networks about what do you believe and what Congress should do. And that would be a great way to actually move elected officials to the right direction. The second um, act, it's, it's a long-term uh, act, and this is actually uh, to learn more about the, uh, the immigration and the immigrant communities. Uh, the immigrant communities is very diverse, um, and it, it, you actually should do um, an effort to, to do some outreach and educate yourself and learn about the, the stories behind uh, the immigration and try so hard not to make immigrants uh, uh, statistics. Um, when you learn uh, about them, about their stories, watch movies like today, talk to an immigrant, um, listen to their stories, uh, learn how they end up, ended up here. Um, that's actually will build a human connection that will take the immigrant issue out of a statistics or out of the numbers and will make it more, um, uh, uh, relatable, and that will that will 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 make things very easy, and will make everyone really understands in a very simple way uh, how much immigrants suffered to reach here. Like Manny was talking today about uh, refugee camps and how much his and his community went through to reach the point that you give up on everything but hope. Um, I myself, I, I, I suffered prison for months, months and months and months um, for one reason only, just because I was advocating for free election. Um, so when you listen to those um, um, uh, stories and, and build a human connection, you will learn um, how much um, immig immigrants are actually enriching our community and how much we need to, them to make a difference. So those are the two things. Vote, make your voice heard and educate yourself and build a human connection to the immigrant communities around you. Okay, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Pepsi, how are we doing? Any questions? Uh, we are good, yep, we have a couple of questions here. Um, one was um, back for Mani, but I think it could be Martine or Ernestine also that could answer this, um, from Eleanor Hong. Um, if uh, if Said still sees similar situation, then what efforts might be done to reunite families um, here? I guess instead of and let alone deportation. What basically what are what are families worried about here, and how are they being um, reunited uh, when they get separated? Are we finding that here in Connecticut? And the second part of that question is where can we locally help refugees settle? Um, settle them into their new homes? Uh, is, is there a center that takes donation? Is tutoring being done? Um, is there something that can happen online or how do we help now? What is the, what is the avenue uh, that we should go down? And maybe anybody can answer that. Maybe we could start with Ern Ernestine. Can you please repeat the last part of the question? <laughs> um, what what can we do locally to help refugees settle? Um, can we offer them clothing? Is there a place where we can bring and donate? Is there tutoring that needs that need to be net met? And how are what's what's available to us to help um, take actions? Okay, so we have many uh, refugee organizations, uh, including Catholic Charities where I serve, where Siri, where Martin serve, IRS in New Haven. 
Connecticut Coalition. So we have a lot of refugees organization here. And yes, we do receive donations. We accept donations to have families, clothing, furniture, monetary donations. Yes. And uh, you said something else about... Um, is there any tutoring <laughs> services or... We provide ESL services through um, not only the agencies themselves, through the Heart for Public Library and also Heart for ed Adult Education. So we have all these different places where they go for not only ESL, but also uh, some education. Okay. It seems like tutoring is becoming a big issue for children oh, yes. who tutoring. are, yeah. Tutoring, I provided. We need volunteers, as a matter of fact, for tutors, as you know, as tutors, and so we meet in uh, half a public library to provide tutoring. We need uh, also uh, mentors, so we need a lot of help for our youth right. population. I'm wondering if uh, maybe Mani or um, someone uh, from the the videos could talk to about reuniting families. Has that happened that you've seen, and how um, uh, how are the immigrants here um, dealing with it, I guess, is the question. Um, yes, um, in terms of uh, our people, Bhutanese community, um, for uh, now, uh, they totally stop from bringing, um, even though we have uh, still people in refugee camp, but uh, the IOM um, office, uh, who help uh, to do all paperwork and resettle is already closed in Nepal. But the people who are uh, scattered uh, in different parts of the um, United States, um, they are uh, reuniting. Um, and I think because of that, we have the larger uh, community here in uh, Columbus, Ohio. But also um, uh, people, uh, they are reuniting and they are moving to Columbus because in some of the state uh, people still they are facing uh, some challenges. For example, you know, um, even though resettlement agencies they do a lot, but still people are um, getting challenges uh, how to apply for citizenship. No one is there to help them for the citizenship process. Um, and people still have challenges, you know, to apply for green card and also to apply for um, driver's license, how to uh, obtain learner's permit. If we uh, can find volunteers uh, from our local level uh, to uh, help refugees on those areas, that will help a lot uh, to succeed them. Thank you. Um, I have one for um, one more for you, Mani, before you go. Um, from um, Abdia, I'm sorry if I'm messing your name up. Abiodum Atlote. <laughs> I'm sure I'm wrong. Um, I have. She says, I have recently been doing some research among refugees with a particular interest in community participation and representation in programs serving the ref refugees. My question re relates to the movement from a translator position to a health to a community health worker, which indicates an increase in the level of involvement. What are the things that you achieved around meeting the needs of the audience you serve as a community health worker that you couldn't as a translator? Um, thank you so much for that question. Uh, I can give an example of the COVID, you know. Uh, I'm very fortunate uh, to have this uh, community health worker training through uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Health when I was in Boston. Um, um, with that skill, I was able to uh, serve my community in this pandemic um, time. You know, it is very uh, hard uh, to people to make them understand, you know, um, and uh, as a, you know, a community health worker, I have a uh, lot of skills and knowledge, and uh, I was helping them uh, in this pandemic. Uh, through our uh, BREP project, through our community center, I was delivering masks and sanitizers and even groceries to door to door uh, to help people, you know, this uh, COVID is real. 
we really need to maintain social distance. We really need to use masks when we go out. You know, um, we still have a lot of piles and piles of hand sanitizers in our office. We get donations from uh, different agencies. So I was uh, able to using um, those skills to help the community. Very good. So important that everybody knows how to protect themselves, take care of themselves, um, especially as we move back to schools and um, as things open up, we still have to protect, protect ourselves. So thank you for that. Um, I have one more for Issam. Um, Issam, how are local government and organ government and organizations offering help towards refugees? What financial aid pre and post COVID is being offered? And do you feel the current elected officials are educated about refugees? Happy to say the mayor is here tonight. So thank you. Um, thanks for reminding me the mayor is here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think I think um, Ernestine or Martin will be the best people to answer the first part of the question. Um, uh, they, they they are the people who work more with the refugees and and what uh, assistance programs are out there for for them. And for the second part of the question, so you reminded me, may, the mayor is here, so I don't know how what to say. <laughs> <laughs> but um, excluding the mayor out of the answer, um, you mm. know, I I do believe. The, the majority of our elected officials are not fully aware um, of the immigration process and, and how much the immigrant community uh, are um, in need and looking for more um, safety and stabi stability. And, I, and I, I, as I mentioned before, I do believe the reason of this is because most most of the uh, of the elected officials will see the immigration and the the immigration process as a statistics as and, and numbers not actual uh, not it, there's not a, enough opportunities for elected officials to actually be in touch with actual the the actual physical immigrant community and i think if they will have these opportunity things might be different uh, but reading out of papers and reports and numbers and statistics it's not the, the most helpful way to be aware of the uh, uh, of the problem um, and I, I again, this is this is part of our responsibility to share this in our uh, networks, whether it's social networks or social media networks and platforms. Um, and this is this is part of what we need to do to to change that. Great, thank you, um, er Ernestine or Martin. Do you want to chime in at all? Sure, I can chime in on this one. Um, and so. The government, the federal government and the state government both work together with resettlement agencies uh, and in that there are funds that are being provided per programming. So every resettlement agencies will offer certain programming, whether it is employment, whether it is uh, the resettlement part, whether it is the education, whether it is a youth program, all of that brings funds to it. Um, so it's important to understand that refugees, when they arrive, they are limited to a cap of $975. That's what they get. So the agency has to work within that money. So if we really look at it realistically, an apartment for, you know, uh, one person already, you know, costs about $800. So if you have to pay the first, the last in the security, that person already does not have money. So. Thankfully, the government is helping in many ways. The state uh, of Connecticut is also helping through a DSS. And with COVID, there has been many grants that has been available. A lot um, of support has been brought in to support rent for families, um, you know, extended uh, benefits for food stamps. So every refugees upon arrival uh, will receive food stamps, uh, Husky, so the insurance, and then they might receive cash assistance through the through DSS, or they might enroll in some uh, federal employment grant that is called matching grant, which is an employment program. Those will help with some money, but it is most important for them to become self-sufficient as fast as possible because the money does run out. We are always in need of money. Money is spent every day. 
um, you know, and, and life here is very expensive. I mean, if we look at somebody that is coming from uh, Tanzania, they are used to pay maybe $15, you know, a month. Um, you know, so coming down here and you're talking about, well, now you're going to spend 800 a month just in your rent. It's very scary. Um, so, you know, it's yes, we do have the help. Uh, there's also a lot of donors. Thankfully, you know, Connecticut is extremely gener generous. Uh, and so you have a lot of independent donors, donors that are just looking at how can I help? Where is it that you have a need? Uh, if you have a child's uh, children's program, they might just fund that program. Or if you have a woman's program, they might just fund that program. And so there is help. Um, you know, so so we, everybody, I think every agency, resettlement agency always looks at, at every possibility. Uh, money is always you know, number one, it's, that's what we are able to move with. That's what you're able to think about services and what you can do to help. Um, but yes, there is help. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, that is about it. Dr. Best, you yeah. have any others? Um, I do have one question and I don't know if we have time for it. Would you say we do? I would say we do. Okay, great. So this one is for Isam or Martin or both, if we have time. Today, immigrants are often stigmatized and blamed because they are different from the dominant culture as it relates to their language, race, religion. What can be done to ensure that everyone is treated with dignity and respect and embrace the diversity that immigrants bring as they contribute new perspectives to its problem solving? Martin, do you like to answer? I'll answer briefly because I know you'll have a longer one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> acceptability. Just accept people as they are. We all are different. We do, um, you know, I mean, this country was founded on immigration. So it is beautiful that we are all different. It's beautiful that we all speak different language, that we have different religion. We can learn from each other. Um, you know, we, we, we can sit around and eat different food. And I mean, you know, you have some of the best food is, you know, comes from immigrants. You look at, you know, refugees at, at, at Syrian food or, or, or whether you have, you know, the Congolese or Senegalese or anything. I mean, it, it's just beautiful. So um, I think it's just acceptance. We look different. It's okay. Um, you know, I mean, everybody, as I think it was Manny who said, we all have the same blood inside and and that's it so yes we look different but we all came to this country with a dream we came with a dream of finding peace of belonging uh and of playing our part we didn't come here just to be quiet and hide either you know we want to be a part of the american society and we are trying and everybody is trying uh and it, you know it, it's just it, it's easier and, and again i think the beauty is that in connecticut we are accepted as we are. And I think that that's it's the most beautiful message is that we, we can be, I can wear a hijab in the street and I know that I am safe. You know, it, it, this is, is something that is absolutely beautiful. So Sam, I will let you finish that one. Um, thank you. Um, actually, yeah, I, I, of course I agree with everything Martin's, Ma Martin said. Um, and I, I think uh, we have a lot of work to do in this front. And, and the first thing we need to do is actually we need more uh, of the event that we have today um, because we really need to we need to share more more and more stories and tell people, um, tell everyone, build this human connection uh, between the different components of our of our society, uh, whether elected officials, different ethnicities, race and, and colors um moving like approaching the prop that the, the point with open mind and leaving all of the stereotypes back at home and and come with an open mind and open heart i think that will be the first step we, we all do um we need we need a lot of reform and a lot of um change in our policy system and regulation system and the serv services system and immigration system um, and that also, all of this cannot be done with one aspect of the community. Um, but events like what we're doing today is the one of the very 
most important steps we should all do and participate in. Um, uh, I, I like I myself. I came after I came. I wasn't. I was actually forced to leave my home country, and I'm. Um, I still can't go back. And I, I moved here just because of looking for safety. And um, and I just wanted, be, literally, I was choosing between move here or go to prison. And that was, uh, it was very important to to come here and find people will be welcoming uh, and understand what I'm coming, what, what I've been through and where I'm coming from and not be judged but what I believe in or the way I look or my accent, um, which which was very thick in the beginning, I hope. Um, it's it, So the idea, and I couldn't survive here um, without a lot of support and uh, people who are very welcoming and, and share a lot, share their homes with me and their dining tables um, with me and listen to my story. And when they learn it, how much uh, what I stand for is, is very repre representative of the country that I live in now, uh, things were really easier for me, for both of us to communicate and build this human connection. Um, so yes, um, it doesn't matter how much our policies will change. It doesn't ma matter how much our immigration system will change. But if we as a community couldn't come to a peace, uh, a peaceful transition to be more welcoming and supportive and look to each other as human beings, I think um, all of our immigrant community and, and our brothers and sisters of the Im immigrants will still suffer from stereotypes and and all of the ism we 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 are facing and we see today um so and this is seriously thank you so much for help to hello Lewis Hartford for doing this and this is i think what we need to do okay thank you so very much i'm going to wrap up and then turn it over to Betsy. i just wanted to say that this has been a wonderful experience i've learned a lot um, it's been informative and educational, and I think coming out of this, I got community is important, diversity is part of life, um, and I think, um, as I mentioned before, for me, I always think in terms of the Sankofa bird looking back to take what's best and bring it forward so that we can survive and thrive. And in doing so, I just want to encourage people while holding the past and holding on to traditions from their country, that they also learn about this country and learn about the, the things that are great about this country and those that are not so great. And that there are people here who've been here since 1600, since the 1600 that um, have been left behind. And so how do we move forward in a way that we can build a community where no one is left behind? All right, so at this point, I just want to turn it over to Betsy. Thank you. Wow, that was an amazing conversation. Um, all of you brought such um, wonderful insight. I can't thank you enough for coming. Um, thanks to our audience. Um, we have really heard amazing stories and it's really given us a lot to learn from, um, to bring it to the present and to the future. Um, following such an inspirational conversation, what action steps will you take? Um, what changes will you make to impact policy, support immigrants and refugees in our community? Here are some ideas. We're gonna put the list into the chat box. Um, you can wel welcome refugees, new immigrants and people who cross cultural borders to your community. You can learn about and get involved in the work of state and local agencies and organizations that provide supportive services to immigrants and refugees. You can call, email, and meet your elected leaders to encourage their support of policies that create, so equal, create equity and inclusion <laughs> to positively impact the lives of refugees and immigrants. Oh, somebody's open. Hi. Somebody's yeah. open. Michael, maybe. Uh, lives of immigrants of refugees and immigrants. Uh, again, see the chat for the list and um, you know, copy it and take it along with you. Um, you could rewatch and share this event from, from West Hartford interactive site at whctv.org or share the YouTube video. 
Uh, this link is also in the chat box. Um, you can practice kindness and inclusion every day in your job and in your social circles. Thank you to all the organizers, co-hosts, and collaborators of this event. To learn more about the new Immigrant Refugee Visions Project, uh, see excerpts from the film and go to csfilms.org or see the link in the chat box. A special thanks goes to Jennifer Evans of West Hartford Community Interactive for giving us the platform to host this event. Uh, please support their work to make community events come to life by donating to WHCI at whctv.org. Finally, thank you to Dr. Best for moderating beautifully and to our panelists for all the thoughtful insights you provided. I'm energized and inspired and excited to see this conversation bring about action. I cannot wait to see how our audience makes it personal to them in our town and beyond. Please let us know how you were inspired. We are looking forward to getting your feedback. Thank you for a wonderful evening. Uh, before I go, though, I want to just, I found a quote that I would like to read, and it's from Max Dupree. He states, We need to give each other space to grow to be ourselves, to exercise our diversity. We need to give each other space so that we may both give and receive such beautiful things as ideas, openness, dignity, joy, healing, and inclusion. Thank you to all of the organizers, co-hosts, and collaborators. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Have a great day. <laughs>